So a bit of a roadmap for where we're going this afternoon. Um, first of all, I'm going to give you a little introduction to crime statistics. This will be less boring than you can imagine. Uh, second of all, I'm going to tell you some of the uses of crime statistics. Along the way, I'm going to tell you some of the stories that uh, lie behind these crime statistics, maybe just to make them a little bit more interesting for you. Then I'm going to talk to you about the abuses of crime statistics, and this is in many ways really the heart of the presentation, because if you learn nothing else when uh, you leave this lecture, I want you to think more critically, or leave thinking much more critically, about what the media have to say about crime and criminal justice. Then I'm going to say a little bit about why these, is a, these abuses are bad rather than just funny, because you will find them funny. First of all, what's a crime? This might seem like a trite question to begin with, but many people get into quite philosophic debate about what constitutes a crime. And I'm going to completely avoid that debate by telling you that for our purposes, a crime is simply an act or omission, by which I mean a failure to act, which is punishable by law. You're probably all quite familiar with crimes like break, enter and steal, otherwise known as burglary, robbery, which is taking something from somebody by violence or the threat of violence and drug trafficking, but you probably didn't know that on the statute books at the moment there are other interesting types of crime you never hear about, or you might have heard about. Insider trading, compassing the sovereign is threatening to overturn the Queen of England as Queen of Australia. Doesn't happen that often. Impeding endeavours to escape a shipwreck wreck is still a crime. It means that when someone asks you is crime on the increase, and nearly every taxi driver I meet asks me that, you really need to ask what crime, what period, what location and how prevalent. The reason the how prevalent bit's important is that uh, it's often ignored by the media, but you can get rapidly increasing crime, which is nonetheless quite rare. So, for example, if you start off with 20 abductions in a year and you move up to 40 abductions in a year, that's a doubling of the crime rate. But in terms of the risk of being abducted, it still remains very low. So when someone says crime has gone up by 30 per cent, it's always important to put that in context. And the relevant context is, what is your risk? What's the base risk of being assaulted or robbed or having your home broken into. What are our sources of information about crime? Well, the most common, of course, is crimes recorded by the police. Uh, every time police, uh, someone reports a crime to police, they're obliged legally to record it. Sometimes, of course, they trip over crime. Crime victim surveys are not, despite what you might think, surveys of victims of crime. They are representative sample surveys of the general population. So each year, for example, the Australian Bureau of Statistics runs a representative sample survey across Australia, I think it's about 11,000 households, and asks members of those households whether they've been victims of crime, and if so, whether they reported those crimes to police. Another source of information about crime is self-report surveys. These are also representative sample surveys of the general population, but instead of asking someone whether they've become a victim of crime, in these surveys they ask somebody whether they've offended. Police arrest data are also sometimes used. Whenever we get questions, for example, about whether youth crime is going up, you can't just rely on the reported crime data because most of the time when someone reports a crime, they don't even know who the offender was or what age the offender was. If someone breaks into your house and, rot and takes all the gear in the house, you, generally speaking, won't see this happen. You won't know the age of the offender. So you have to rely on what police find when they arrest people. So in the case of whether youth crime is increasing, we would go to police arrest data to see whether or not the number of young people proceeded against by police has gone up. Court data are also useful for measuring crime, not so much because of trends in court appearances, but because sometimes you want to run a program to reduce reoffending. Now, the only way we can measure reoffending is reconviction. So, for example, we might run a program such as the drug court program, where we give drug dependent property offenders uh, intensive supervision and drug treatment, and we want to know whether this has reduced the rate at which they reoffend. Well, what we might do is compare the rate of reconviction among those who go on the drug court program with the rate of reconviction of people who are, say, put in jail and subsequently released. So that's how court data become useful. Lastly, there's accident and emergency data. It's a sad but useful fact for statisticians that some people who commit crime suffer as a result. Heroin overdose, for example, is a very good marker of heroin use. So when heroin overdose goes up, it's a fair bet that heroin use is going up. So there's three things to remember about crime. The first is that before an incident can be recorded as a crime, someone actually has to decide that it is a crime. And that isn't as obvious as you might think. Even now, a large percentage of victims of domestic violence don't regard what happened to them as a crime, even though it is. The second thing that has to happen is that some decision has to be made about whether to report it to police. And as you'll see shortly, 
a great deal of crime is not reported to police. And lastly, police have to accept the report as genuine, and they don't always accept the report as genuine. And what this means in practice is that the recorded crime rate, the, the rate of crime based on police figures is influenced by a whole bunch of factors other than just the incidence of crime. It's affected by public opinion on what constitutes a crime. It's affected by public willingness to report a crime. It's affected by police willingness to record it or their, their recording practices and their resources. It's even affected by the, the criminal law, change the criminal law, and you'll also get changes in recorded crime. Although the media don't believe it, there's also quite marked seasonal and chance variation. And as I've said before, uh, there's quite marked variation according to whether the offence is reported or discovered. Now that's all just speech. Let's have a look at just exactly how this plays out in practice. Here's the, uh, I'm going to show you the variation reporting. These data come from the National Crime Victims Victimisation Survey. Here, what percentage of threat and assaults do we think are reported to police? 31.9. Adult sexual assault, what percentage reported? 36.6. Break and enter, 76%. And motor vehicle theft, 81%. Why are break and enter and motor vehicle theft so much more reported? Guesses. Insurance, exactly. People report it even when their car hasn't been stolen to claim on the insurance. <laughs> None of you, of course. OK, variation in crime reporting. This is a graph that we showed uh, some years ago. Everything was trundling along quite nicely. This is the trend in steel from the person. And suddenly it jumped up. And uh, we had a look into this before the figures became public and found that the police had changed their definition of stealing offences so that things that had previously been general stealing became stealing from the person. And of course the numbers jumped up immediately and then resumed their flat trend. So I went to a press conference and explained all this to the attending media that this was no increase in crime, this was nothing more than a change in the police definition of stealing, and of course they all reported it as a whopping increase in the amount of stealing from the person. But it just goes to illustrate quite nicely, I think, how important uh, police definitions are to trends in crime. And one of the things the New South Wales Police have cottoned on to is that the quickest way to get someone into jail, even before they're convicted, is to watch out, watch them after they've got bail and see if they breach their bail conditions. So they, got, they went after this with great a great deal of enthusiasm. So what you see there is the number of cases of breach bail uh, from January 1995 uh, through to the present. You see this enormous increase. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with a growing willingness to breach bail, everything to do with the police tactic uh, to try and control crime. Uh, and you may well wonder what the wisdom is of trying to control crime by locking up unconvicted people, but that's another story. OK, the criminal law. Uh, years and years ago, probably before most of you were born, uh, there was an act in place in New South Wales called the Offences in Public Places Act. This is an act which governed just exactly what kinds of things are offensive behaviour. Uh, and it was drawn in very careful terms to avoid um, penalising or criminalising uh, behaviour that most people might engage in. But it was one of those days where we had yet another law and order auction and the incoming government promised to get a lot tougher on offensive behaviour and brought in what's called the Summary Offences Act. The Summary Offences Act made it a lot easier to arrest people for swearing, in particular swearing in a public place. And immediately the number of people picked up for offensive behaviour went from 1181 to 4643. This was not because there were a lot more people out there swearing. This was because what used to be regarded as non-criminal became brought or was brought within the scope of the law. So simply changing the law can have a big effect on the amount of recorded crime and, and that's a classic uh, example. Um, chance variation. Um, this is the trend in, in New South Wales murder victims. Anybody see a pattern there? There is no pattern. This is just random variation. And yet you wouldn't believe the number of journalists who will happily look at the number four in December and the number eight and say the murder rate has doubled. And the reason they say that is they're quite, happily, uh, quite happy to ignore chance variation. And one of the key tests for whether there's a trend in crime is whether or not there's any significant change, whether or not the pattern you're looking at could have come about by chance. That's certainly not the end of the story, as you'll see, but it's an important part of the process. But it gets more interesting than that. This is seasonal variation in non-domestic assault. And what you're looking at is all these peaks. You notice how the peaks are happening uh, in summer? Why might that be? Sorry? More people drinking. What about the second peak? It's, if you can't quite see it, it's happening in March. 
Part of it too, believe it or not, is that March often has more weekends than February and people drink on weekends. So something as simple as that can make a difference to the, the pattern. But again, you will find the media more than happy to talk about a rapid increase in crime uh, in December as if that was something unusual and completely ignoring the rapid, rapid decline during the winter months. Okay, so the golden rule then is you don't observe uh, a change in crime, you infer uh, a trend in crime. And you do it by asking these sorts of questions. Could the observed trend or pattern have come about by chance? Has anything happened to encourage better recording or reporting? And is the trend consistent with other relevant crime victim survey data or emergency department data? So every time we make a judgment about whether a crime is going up or down, we're going through that process and you should go through that process too. If you see a stark graph in some media outlet showing a whopping increase in crime or the police are trumpet, trumpeting some amazing fall in crime, ask yourself, is it consistent with what the other data are showing? Uh, is there anything happening that might encourage uh, better reporting or recording? Uh, is the increase in assault, for example, following a campaign to encourage women to report violence? These are all uh, relevant considerations. So one obvious use of crime statistics, of course, is to measure crime trends. And this is one I think that surprises a lot of people. This is a trend in murder in Australia, homicide in Australia, uh, since 1989. And it may surprise you to discover that you're less likely to die now than you were out of murder, less likely to be deliberately killed uh, than you were. It used to be about two per 100,000 of population. Uh, in Australia it's dropped down below 1.5. In New South Wales it's dropped down to about one per 100,000 of population. Any theories about why the murder rate is falling? Quality of medical care. Maybe they're getting better at saving people who are seriously injured. And in fact there's this fascinating article in the United States called Murder and Medicine where they make uh, a quite convincing case for the fact that the reason the homicide rate in the United States is falling is not because fewer people are being attacked or even shot, but because hospitals are becoming much better at dealing with gunshot victims, especially in the wake of the Vietnam War, where they had thousands of people being shot and they became particularly skilled at stopping them dying. So there's a potentially humdrum. The honest answer is I don't know why the murder rate is dropping. OK, measuring crime prevalence. I said earlier that crime victim surveys are very useful as a check on crime, and they are, and here's a good example. These were the national police figures showing the difference in the assault rate between New South Wales and Victoria. And you can see that if you believe these figures, New South Wales has a far higher assault rate than Victoria. 1,599 per 100,000 of population compared with Victoria's 573 or 574 per 100,000 of population. And the Victorians crowed about this a lot. They used it in their tourism ads. Uh, they used it to bang, uh, bash the government in New South Wales. Look how safe Victoria is. Some of us, though, have always had doubts. And the reason we've had doubts is this. This is what you get when you compare New South Wales and Victoria on the crime victim surveys. Now, the really interesting thing about the crime victim surveys is you pick up crimes regardless of whether or not they're reported to police. And the amazing thing here is that if you look at the victim surveys, the prevalence of assault in Victoria is, if anything, slightly more. It's actually not a significant difference. But the two states are neck and neck in terms of the prevalence of assault. The reason the Victorian recorded assault rate is lower is because the police in Victoria won't record a domestic violence unless the police, unless the victim is willing to take action. Now, in New South Wales, that would be unacceptable. You also get other interesting things out of the victim survey. Uh, this is the prevalence of assault by age group. And although it's elderly people who generally fear assault most, it's you lot that are most at risk. So 6% of you uh, are going to experience an assault or threatened assault um, uh, in, the next, in the previous 12 months you would have. 5.5% drops away quite sharply as you get uh, into the, the older age group. So marked differences in the risk of victimisation. If you were to draw a graph of fear of assault, it would go the other way. The fear would go up. One of the more interesting uses of, of uh, crime statistics, though, is mapping. Now, what you're looking at there is a map of the distribution of alcohol-related crime uh, in the Sydney metropolitan area. So you see the black bit? You see where that black bit is? Right on top of New South Wales University? Yeah, right around here. You can see it's quite high as well uh, in the Hawkesbury, Gosford, Wyong area. But you don't have to map at that high level. You can zoom in and have a closer look. This is King's Cross. Okay, so that, 
I don't have a pointer. That, that, that long li horizontal line there is Darlinghurst Road. Okay, you see the railway station? And the dots with the, the big dots with the numbers, that tells you how many incidents occurred there. And you can see that there's a big dot outside the railway station. But you'll also see some problems uh, down Bayswater Road. Um, and of course, a lot of these assaults congregate around uh, licensed premises. So the point of this is that by mapping the distribution of crime, you can develop effective crime prevention strategies. Uh, you can find out this for bank robberies or uh, robberies of other kinds for different kinds of crime. And that can give you a clue to how you might go about uh, preventing crime. A lot of fun. Evaluating policy. Uh, here's a really interesting thing. Um, some time ago, uh, Newcastle, the Liquor Administration Board in Newcastle, got fed up with the number of alcohol-related assaults that were going on in Newcastle CBD and slapped a whole bunch of restrictions on, I think it was the 14 licensed premises in Newcastle. They included earlier closing, uh, lockouts, no shots uh, with drinks, um, a whole bunch of other things designed to crack down on what they thought were the causes of alcohol-related crime. Now the intriguing thing from a research perspective is that Hamilton, which is right next door and has plenty of pubs, didn't have these restrictions. So here we've got the ideal chance for an, a natural experiment. So this is the trend in assaults in Newcastle and the vertical line shows you the point at which those restrictions were imposed. And as you can see, uh, the assault rate was trending between 15 and 20 assaults per month and then straight after the restrictions it started dropping away. But the interesting question is what happened in Hamilton? Because a drop like that might have happened everywhere. So we have a look at what went on in Hamilton. And absolutely nothing happened in Hamilton. So there's a nice, neat de demonstration of the way in which you can use crime statistics uh, to evaluate policy. This is what we have to put up with on a day-to-day -day basis. So just before we start, it's worthwhile looking at the different types of abuse that you can encounter. Um, selective use of data is by far and away the most common. Uh, selective reporting of the facts is probably the second most common. Uh, misleading commentary is a common one. Uh, misrepresentation of the facts, which is a sweet way of saying lying. I'm going to show you a flagrant example of lying in the media. Uh, and misleading headlines uh, and playing games with drug statistics is another favourite one of, of politicians. So what I'm going to do now is walk you through some illustrative examples of each one of those types of abuse. So some years ago, just to kick off, we gave a section of the media, I can't remember who it was, we gave them this trend. So if you look at the top, you can see the number of people who'd been, number of cases of driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs. And you can see that it went from 1,315 down to 1,300 and steadily declined uh, to 1,094. And a statistical test shows that this is significantly down, down by 15.2%. There is another offence uh, related to this called, called exceeding the prescribed concentration of alcohol. This is basically your, your drink drive RBT test. Uh, these trends weren't really doing anything. They were doing what I've mentioned earlier, uh, subjecting themselves to random variations. So we gave the media those sets of figures and we advised them that driving under the influence of alcohol was down and that PCA offences were stable. That's a pretty clear message, I would have thought. This was their response. Oh, we said. As I said, you'll see the trends are either down or stable. What they said was drink drive accelerates, of course. And everybody picks this sort of thing up and immediately assumes that drink driving is getting far worse than it actually is. Uh, here's another example. One of the more egregious we came across uh, in the last few years. Uh, we said to the media who had asked us about the idea of young people under the age of 10 coming to the attention of police. Uh, and that had fallen from 130 a month in 2005 to 94 a month in 2007. And for good measure, we also pointed out that less than 1% of the New South Wales population aged 8 or 9 had had any contact with police in the preceding 12 months. That, you would have thought, is enough to kill a story about rising uh, uh, sub-10-year-old crime stone dead. We also pointed out, though, for good measure, that when you're under the age of 10, you actually can't be arrested because it's below the age of criminal responsibility. People under the age of 10 are not regarded as capable of committing a crime because they haven't got sufficiently developed sense of moral responsibility of intent and consequence. But, of course, the media were delighted with this story. They said there was a kid crime rampage. Here's another example, and this is a really good example of police, of uh, the media lying. We put out a report uh, which showed there was no link between the heroin shortage 
and the increase in amphetamine use. For those of you who don't know, during the period in which heroin's become less frequently used, there's been a very big increase in amphetamine use. And it's been one of the issues has been whether or not former heroin users are switching to amphetamines. And it's an important issue because if the heroin shortage only increases amphetamine use, you haven't really succeeded. So we had a look at it to see whether there's any relationship between the two and found that there wasn't. But this is what they said. Heroin users switched to ice. It was completely wrong. And when I raised this issue with them, complained to them about the fact that they had completely misrepresented our media release, they were pretty much dismissive. In fact, it took some time for them to put a correction in the paper. And when they did, it was so obscure, you never would have found it. OK, you remember I said earlier that um, uh, random variation is a notable feature of, of crime trends. Here you've got the trend in assault with a knife, sword, scissors or screwdrivers. Sorry about the category. I think they're mostly knives. There's not too many swords. But police, <laughs> <laughs> police like to have a, a generic category. So, not a very interesting news story. Uh, we told them that statistical testing revealed no upward or downward trend, but stabbing skyrocketed as knives plague city. I guess the only thing you can be happy about is that they didn't say swords were plaguing the city. <laughs> but this kind of thing is relentless. These aren't isolated cases. This goes in week on, week in, week out. The media misleading the public about what goes on with crime. And for the obvious reason that sexy crime stories sell newspapers, increase uh, television ratings, and in increase radio ratings. Um, here are some examples of abuses of crime statistics by politicians and public servants, because the media are certainly not the only ones who do this. I should say that they engage in all the things that I've been describing the media as doing, not so much in New South Wales these days, uh, but certainly in other states which don't have a Bureau of Crime Statistics and Research. In fact, you'll find in other states it's very difficult for anyone to get access to crime statistics other than through the police themselves. Now, here are a few examples of drug statistics uh, I'm sure you've all seen footage of police standing happily beside large numbers of packets of heroin or methamphetamine or whatever, uh, claiming success because they've caught all this uh, or discovered all these illegal drugs and they claim success in intercepting them. Well, that might be okay, but the trouble is when seizures go down, they also claim success in reducing the importation of drugs. So here's a case where politicians try to have it both ways. When the seizures go up, it's because they're catching more of the drugs coming into the country. When they go down, it's because fewer drugs are coming into the country. And we're still in Australia in a situation where we don't have any decent indicators for the effectiveness of drug law enforcement. Obviously, seizures are completely uh, useless when it comes to judging progress in, in uh, managing or controlling illegal drugs. But you see the same thing in relation to arrests for drug use. Uh, I've given an example of this in the uh, Uses and Abuses of Crime Statistics report. When arrests for drug use go up, they claim success for catching more drug users. And of course, when they go down, they claim success in stopping drug use. Well, you can't have it both ways. It's going to be one or the other. Actually, what you really need is a better measure of success in controlling drug use. And the only measure we've got that works at the moment is overdoses, but that doesn't work too well for drugs on which you don't overdose very often, such as cannabis use uh, and the like. OK, another trick is when you seize a large quantity of heroin, you state its price in terms of street value. You know, we've discovered or caught or intercepted $20 million worth of ecstasy tablets. It sounds fantastic. You can just imagine the drug traffickers moaning in their sleep about the amount of money they lost, the $20 million. Well, it's all quite misleading because the real loss to the drug dealer is the amount they paid for the drug. And that's usually substantially less than the amount of money they sell it for. So, for example, in the case of a kilo of heroin, they might pay $8,000 or $10,000 to buy it, but they'll sell it for a lot more. The problem with this, of course, is it gives the public a misleading picture of the effectiveness of drug law enforcement. If you think they've been whacked for 20 million worth of drugs, you'll think police are successful. If, in truth, they're losing 8,000, you'll realise the battle they've got ahead of them is much bigger than it looks. OK, why does it matter, all this abuse of crime statistics? Why isn't it just amusing? Uh, or just depressing? Well, there's a whole lot of reasons why uh, this issue is important for public policy. And I want to illustrate this by reference to a survey we conducted uh, some years ago looking at public perceptions of crime and public confidence in the criminal justice system. We asked a representative sample of uh, New South Wales citizens whether they think there's more property crime, less property crime, or about the same amount uh, over the last five years. And this was at a time when crime rates were rapidly falling. 
And what we got was 29% saying a lot more. Uh, we had 20 odd percent saying a little more, about 32% saying uh, it was about the same. There are very few people who were saying that there was a lot less or a little less, even though that was a correct response. So here we were five years into falling crime rates and the vast majority of New South Wales residents thought crime was going up or remaining stable. Here's another example. We asked people in New South Wales whether or not every, out of every 100 crimes recorded by the police, what number do you think involved violence or the threat of violence? Now each one of these bars shows you the percentage uh, who thought, don't ignore the weighted bit, shows you the percentage you thought a given uh, percent was violent. So for example, about 18% of people said about 50% of the crime reported to police is violent. And you can see that about 14% uh, thought 60% uh, of, of crime reported to police was violent. So on for, uh, for um, about 12%, looks like about 12% said 70%. The important point is you see all those bars congregated up to the right. Clearly, most people think a large percentage of crime reported to the police is violent. And why do they think that? Well, they think that because the media report nothing but violent crime. They don't report boring car thefts and boring burglaries. The true proportion that's violent is way down there, way down the bottom end. Less than 10% of the crime reported to police involves any violence or threat of violence. It's not much higher if you exclude driving, which accounts for a lot of the uh, offences that occur. Here's another example. We ask people, of every 100 people charged with burglary, what percentage are brought to, uh, brought to court end up convicted? Now you can see, I won't go through each individual bar now, but you can see the way they stack up to the left there. Uh, most people thought that less than 50% of those charged with burglary are convicted. Well, this is completely and utterly wrong. The true percentage from the higher criminal courts is up above 80%. And the true percentage for the local courts is above 70%. So the vast majority of burglars that are caught end up convicted. They're not uh, escaping conviction, despite what the media might say. Well, what does all this mean? Well, if you ask people how confident they are in the criminal justice system, you get a pretty depressing result. You find that only 6.9% are very confident that the criminal justice system brings people to, to justice. 48% are fairly confident. 30%, um, one in three odd, are not, not very confident. More than one in 10 are not at all confident. Uh, thankfully, 1.2% don't have a clue. <laughs> Got to be grateful for small mercies. Well, what are the consequences of that lack of confidence? I should point out before I go on to this that the people who had least confidence were the people who failed our knowledge test the most. In other words, those who are most wrong about what was happening to crime, those who are most wrong about the conviction rate, and those who are most wrong about the percentage going to prison were also the ones who had least confidence in the criminal justice system. Those who knew more, people like yourselves, tended to have more confidence. So there was a direct link, if you like, between ignorance and confidence. Well, one thing it does is resulted in dist distorted government spending priorities. The government so constantly, it doesn't matter which government it is, is so constantly under attack on law and order. They're constantly having to spend money on more police and tougher penalties, or they feel they have to, in order to reassure the public that crime's under control. When they spend money on police, or when they spend money on putting more people in jail, they have less money to spend on education, less money on schools, less money on hospitals. So this is a real effect. In effect, what's happening is that when the media misreport crime, the long-term effect is a distortion of government spending priorities. The other thing, of course, is ineffective law and order policies. Because people are misled about what's effective in controlling crime, they tend to assume that when the police are going to, have, when they're going to put more police on the beat or lock more people up, that that's going to reduce crime. Well, sometimes it does, but very often the effect is much less than people imagine. The third thing that happens is taxpayers' money is simply wasted. Uh, whenever they invest money in an ineffective policy, uh, whether that be, for example, mandatory minimum sentencing, that's money down the drain. It's $220 a day to keep someone in jail. You want to be sure you're getting value for your money if you're going to lock someone up. Uh, and a lot of the money that is spent uh, locking people up doesn't really generate much return in terms of public safety. There's also the problem of public fear and anxiety. I know that this probably doesn't affect you lot much. Uh, you probably don't constrain your movements too much out of fear, perhaps you do, out of fear of walking around. But elderly people seriously constrain their movements because of fear about becoming victims of crime. 
And in many, not all, but in many circumstances, those fears are completely unwarranted. So it has a real effect on people who feel vulnerable on their freedom, the freedom they enjoy to move around and, and do things unimpeded by concern about whether they're going to become victims of crime. And when we've done surveys of what people think the likelihood of being assaulted or becoming a victim of burglary or becoming a victim of car theft is, people habitually overestimate their risks. I've mentioned the loss of freedom. That's pretty much the story as far as I'm concerned. Uh, this is our website where you'll find lots more interesting information. I know you've got a question. If you can just hang on to that question for a sec. Uh, other key websites worth uh, looking into, they're all listed here. Uh, I'm not going to read every one of them out. Uh, all good places to go. One thing I would mention, the Campbell Collaboration. <clears throat> just Google Campbell Collaboration. If you ever want to know what works, that's the place to go. Uh, they do systematic reviews of what works to prevent uh, crime and control crime. Uh, US Bureau of Justice Statistics. What can you do? Well, above everything else, uh, think critically about news. Don't take what you read in the newspapers or see on television or hear on the radio for granted. Do your own research. Uh, there are plenty of opportunities to go and find out for yourself, especially these days. Uh, you don't have to rely on what the media tell you or the mass media tell you. You can find out yourself. I've mentioned that. Don't listen to the shock jocks. Uh, join our email list and follow us on Twitter. Uh, it's always a good way to get it. So any questions people want to ask, because that's pretty much my story.